looking around, there, there are probably quite a few familiar faces to you in this crowd. This is uh, like a reunion. It's uh, really exciting to just see what uh, Rod and Helen and I started back yeah. in 1990 and uh, feel a little bit of influence in the gathering we have today. It, every single person we've talked to, it seems like everybody has made their way through the halls of iRobot at some point or another. Well, it's a, a sort of a crucible of, okay, if you're going to be a robot company, we have to figure out how to build something that customers actually yeah. want to buy. And, and that crucible, I think, has an uh, influence on uh, a lot of people. And whether they stay or go, uh, they can take that, <laughs> that uh, uh, unforgiving lesson uh, with them wherever they go. Life is hard. You can do with this information what you want. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so we've also had the pleasure of having a lot of students out here. We're, we're on the MIT campus, and I think that you're probably, quite possibly, the person best equipped to answer this question. If you could give one piece of advice to all the students here as far as actually making the jump from research into industry, what would it be? Well, first, um, the idea that you launch with, you'll either be very, very lucky or wrong, <laughs> and um, you need to stay open to uh, learning uh, what uh, the rest of the world has to, uh, how it reacts to your ideas, and be flexible. I think that um, patience is also critically important. Uh, it's best not to do it alone. At iRobot, mm -hmm. um, if we had been a singular team as opposed to the three of us, it would have been a very different experience because we tried to arrange that no one could have crushing despair at the same time the other two of us were having crushing despair because that was just, that was against the rules and so someone had to... Somebody has to be, go out and be the cheerleader? Be the cheerleader. Yeah. And it, it switches, <laughs> of course, but, but it's important that you don't all do it at the same time. Yeah. So what, what role can universities actually play in helping students make that transition? Well, I think that universities... Um, they've seen this rodeo before. They know that um, entrepreneurship is something to be nurtured, at least a, uh, an enlightened uh, university, certainly like MIT does it as well as anyone, and do their best to help these companies at the embryonic stage. What, did you know you need to worry about IP? Did you know you had to worry about uh, IP? Uh, uh, HR issues, how are you actually going to get your product built? Um, I think that uh, um, actually in, in uh, my case, I was super lucky to have a professor, uh, Rodney Brooks, uh, be part of the founding team and so that he could bring his experience to the, to, to the group and help us avoid many of the early fatal things that we might have done. So uh, I think that uh, universities that want to help can be a tremendous boon to, uh, to an embryonic startup. It seems like defense funding is a huge part for uh, just about every large company. Certainly it played a pretty big role in the founding of iRobot. Um, mm -hmm. How important are organizations like DARPA to keeping the commercial robotics industry afloat? Well, I mean, certainly iRobot wouldn't be around yeah. um, without DARPA and without uh, the, the government contracting that, that, uh, and funding that we got through that venue. You know, any small business has to figure out how it's going to go and, and pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And getting um, grant money from the DOD is a great way to do it. It carries a lot of um, responsibility. You're, you're actually making commitments. You're expected to actually make deliverables, you expect to actually account. I remember it was incredibly traumatic for us when we had to um, calculate how much money it actually cost to build a robot because we had to build the government. They wanted us to record our time accurately, fairly, and in ink. Because, and you talk about the importance of having patience, but at the same time you have to figure out how to pay for that patience. There are certainly two things in tension, yeah. um, but uh, both critical to, to ultimately succeed. Uh, you know, iRobot, um, uh, I think Helen said the, the, uh, something about um, uh, how rapidly we became a success story. It only took us about 12 years. Um, but 
many of the great companies, I think iRobot is an outlier in how to do it as slow and painfully as possible, but um, uh, it's rare to find a, uh, a company that does it swiftly, where the original idea is the idea that actually becomes the, uh, the success. And, uh, and so that this idea that raise money when things are good, even if you're not sure you need it, uh, so that you can weather when things are less good, um, and give yourself permission to restart as necessary is all part of the maneuvering through the entrepreneurial journey. How does the reality for a company like iRobot change when you move from DARPA funding into the consumer space? Well, I mean, luckily we didn't have to do both at once. You didn't have to pull the, uh, the rug out? No, the record. In fact, yeah. we had, um, you know, in 2002, we uh, had... Uh, it was a transformational year for, for iRobot. We uh, sent our robots over to Afghanistan, and we launched the Roomba. Um, one made money, one made revenue, and they were not the same. And so that the success that we had with our defense business actually paid for the entire learning process, which was unforgiving and brutal. I didn't know I had to care about reverse logistics. I didn't, you know, the, the idea that we had launched this fantastic product that worked tremendously well, then um, <coughs> broke after six months because people used it so much. Mm -hmm. And so we had to uh, be very generous with our, our um, uh, customer service and support while we sprinted to make one that actually lasted three years. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we had uh, an economic engine that was paying for all these screw-ups on the consumer side was incredibly important. And uh, over time, uh, there was sort of a shifting in the balance of economic uh, drivers in the company, and, and the consumer really started to take off. What was it? Why was, why was the Roomba the thing that finally hit from, for the company from a commercial standpoint? Because the Roomba delivered far more value than it cost. And there was a comment earlier today about, um, you know, good business isn't one of these, well, sure, I'll give it a try. It's this passion, uh, this, this, this magic, you know, you, you, um, uh, you know it when it's there because it's not a subtle thing. And uh, there was this moment um, mm -hmm. uh, in the Roomba story where um, when I'm asked, when did you know this was going to work? Yeah. And we had launched our product, and um, <clears throat> we had snuck into, into a Brookstone, um, <laughs> where uh, there was our first big retailer, and it was only because the person we demoed to uh, hadn't yet been told how to say no to people like us. She had, it was her second day on the job, and, <laughs> and uh, so she actually took the meeting. We got in, we demonstrated our robot. She said, oh my God, this is great. Um, and uh, in a matter of um, 30 minutes or so, we had gone up five levels into the organization and, and uh, um, were off and running. And um, we launched in, in September, and this was uh, late September, and I got a call from the buyer, Pam Camelstein. I still remember her name, and she's like, Colin, how's, how's it going? He's like, well, well, how's it going with you? <laughs> and she's like, oh, it's pretty well. We were, we were uh, under uh, curious um, if we needed more product, um, would that be possible? And she said, oh, yes, that would be possible. How, you know, how many do you want? And your response was, how many can you make? <laughs> And we sold 70,000 robots um, between September and end of December that first year. And that was the, uh, the impetus. And we knew it. Be we were winning because people were just loving the product, coming to us and saying, can I have more? Can I have more? And so that there may be other tremendous things uh, that will have a similar reaction in the marketplace. And we're seeing some of this. But, um, uh, and so that it wasn't that Roomba had to be the first great yeah. success for consumer robotics, but it certainly was. And, and um, this is a milestone for robotics. In 2016, the entry-level Roomba was the number one selling vacuum cleaner in the United States, <laughs> which I think is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And in fact, this September actually marks 15 years for the Roomba. I think so. that's, that's, a, that's math, what yep, I was sounds, told. Sounds yeah. good. Yep, math. 
why wasn't the Roomba more of a catalyst for other home robots? I mean, we've seen, we've seen some attempts, but we haven't seen anything come nearly as close to the Roomba to actually be a, a truly mainstream home robot. I would say that that's a point of frustration for me at, at this point. I think that if you asked uh, me back when we started, okay, 27 years uh, in the future, iRobot's going to be successful. Describe to me what iRobot has accomplished. Uh, there's no way I would have said, well, we're going to have disrupted the vacuuming industry. Um, so I'm both <laughs> excited that we have and, and disappointed. I, I, I think uh, Ty said it earlier. Um, when he said, we're just getting started, I like to say, we're just about none of the way to realizing the potential of, I, of, of robotics. And, um, you know, I think what we need is ideas coupled with great business plans and business people who understand the customer in order to break this thing open. Uh, you know, I had some kid, I still remember it, he came up to me after one of these speaking things and he said, Colin, You've done robot vacuuming and bomb disposal robots. You've done it all. <laughs> Why didn't you leave something left for us? And he was actually serious, which was... I, I tried not to laugh in his face because he was trying to be actually sincere. But uh, really, uh, we need to do more. And we need to do more not motivated by the excitement and coolness of robotics, but by the demand and knowing the customer and what do they want and how do we meet their needs, and this is hard, at a price uh, below the value you're delivering. And the company is obviously still committed to the Roomba. And in fact, the next big step for iRobot is making the Roomba a larger part of the connected home. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I, I, we're, there's lots more we can do with Roomba. Um, there's lots of... Uh, areas to grow. We're still in single digits of household penetration. Um, but there's so much more happening. And where I'm personally really passionate right now is, is how robots are going to enable the smart home. Because let's face it, the, the smart home as it exists today is not sufficiently useful for it to go and hit its inflection uh, point. And why? Because all of this great AI stuff that we've been talking about today doesn't have enough context to actually work the way it's supposed to. So, uh, you know, there's questions about, you know, uh, aren't we worried about AI? Well, um, you can be worried about AI, but you, you shouldn't necessarily be worried about AI at a robot conference. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't know where anything is, and so it's hard to be intelligent. <laughs> Right? I mean, we, we've the robots had... can't get you because they can't find you. Right. I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> how many decades ago could we, did we have AI that could interpret the sentence, go to the kitchen and get me a beer? But if you don't know where the kitchen is, it really doesn't help. And so the great uh, hurdle or obstacle for robotics right now, at least in the home, is understanding the context that robots must have in order to be intelligent, in order to know where the kitchen is, in order to recognize the, the refrigerator, open up the door, do object segmentation, find the beer, and grab it. So um, we're, some of the, the, the challenges in robotics has to do with sort of the foundational work of understanding the environment, and it's actually pretty hard. So I'm going to steal one of your better lines that you didn't find success in robotics until you became a vacuum salesman. Yes. <laughs> uh, when... I, think, I think the, the true was, it was, was um, I, I would say, I used to be a, a self-respecting high-tech CEO, <laughs> but I didn't have any actual yeah. commercial success until I realized I was a vacuum cleaning salesman. And that has, uh, there's way more truth than there should be in that statement. Obviously, being pragmatic is a big part of, of iRobot's success, but you know, when, when you look at a show like this, or when you look at the robotics industry in, in general, and so many of these companies are focused on making the big, exciting, sexy new thing, is, is it hard to attract and maintain talent when you are, at your core, a robotic vacuum company? Well, um, no. Uh, because the vision is, is there, and... and um, you know, I will have, by the end of the year, two million connected devices that move around people's homes and uh, 
carry sensors, uh, which is super cool. And we're working on some of the uh, most cutting edge navigation technology in the world. Um, the, um, and we can deploy at such a scale that it's, it's exciting. And uh, now with cloud connectivity, we have uh, computation both on the robots and the cloud so we can do um, increasingly cool things. And so that, uh, no, I, I think iRobot is, uh, if you are interested in working in robotics and uh, not embroiled in your own um, uh, entrepreneurial adventure, um, boy, you could do a lot worse than coming and, and uh, uh, working with us. I, I do suspect, though, that letting people have their own pet projects has to be a big part of that as well. You've got a lot of really smart people working for the company. You want to let them set aside some time to, to work on these things. Is, is that a big part of iRobot's culture? Um, we do have sort of 10, we call it 10% time, mm -hmm. um, where if, you're, if you work at iRobot, you, you get to work on pet projects. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's 10% time, but, but even I have a pet project. So uh, um, we divested our, our defense business, and I think it left a little bit of a hole where I wanted to figure out how can robots give back. And so I started a, a, um, a nonprofit called Robots in Service of the Environment, uh, and we're building, uh, with this cool tech uh, toolkit of low-cost robotics, strategies for environmental problems that... Um, uh, heretofore don't have great solutions. And so that, uh, and some, some of the guys at iRobot um, work on that with their 10% time. Some of them work on completely off the wall, crazy, wonderful things. You've got to watch the video of the lionfish thing that your team created. It's a, it's a little like robot gun that you bring around in the water and actually sucks lionfish into it. It's an underwater Roomba. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, where you stun the lionfish and you suck them yeah. in and, and we uh, capture them. So. What role are these pet projects going to play in the company moving forward? I mean, are, are these essential to a large company continuing to innovate? I think it's essential to maintaining a culture of innovation where, you know, when you're a big company, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You know what the customers say, you should be working on it, and that's actually true. You should be working on it to advance uh, the state of the art and make the next um, home robot even more wonderful. But in event, invention shouldn't just be the, uh, the domain of the tech org, is what we call it within iRobot. Certainly, a lot of invention, of invention happens, but ideas can come from anywhere, and we want to make sure that there's a way that we can encourage that type of uh, gr grassroots uh, innovative thinking, um, despite us all having day jobs doing that which is very well-defined. And you do, obviously, you do want the next Roomba to happen within the walls of iRobot. That would be very beneficial to you as a company. Yeah, that would be great. Great. Colin, thank you so much. My pleasure.